All right, welcome to a brief discussion of the underlying principles behind melting points and what exactly determines the melting behavior of organic crystalline solids. So let's start, as we normally do, with a question. And that is, how do intermolecular forces drive the phase behavior of binary mixtures of solids? And to do this, we're going to have to introduce our usual cast of characters. Uh, first, a molecule of our product of interest, which we're going to make the green squares again. And a molecule of impurity. Also, as before, we're going to use red triangles to depict uh, molecules of an impurity. And let's take a look at how a pure sample would melt and how an impure sample would melt. So again, let's begin by considering the melting behavior of a pure sample of organic crystalline solid. Shown here in the top right of the slide is our cartoon representation of a pure crystal. Notice that all of these green squares fit together very well. They tessellate really nicely, and that's a metaphor for the optimized intermolecular attractions that take place when the same type of molecule fits into the crystal in the same orientation as the others. We've maximized the attractive forces between these individual molecules. So this crystal is being held together by strong intermolecular forces, or at least stronger intermolecular forces. And we'll think about what that means as we apply heat. So as we begin to heat the sample, molecular vibrations increase, uh, and as you can see, the crystal begins to have little individual vibrations. But notice that nothing is actually free to move as though it were a liquid around the, within the bulk of the volume. They're still constrained. This is because those intermolecular attractions have not yet been overcome by the thermal energy that's been introduced to the system. As we increase the temperature and add more energy to the system, the vibrations increase as well. And at the moment, they're still not adequate to overcome the attractive forces holding the crystal together. But at some point, if we continue to increase the temperature, we will increase the amount of thermal energy within the system, and eventually we will overcome those forces, and those individual molecules will be free to move within the volume occupied by what is now the liquid. The temperature at which these forces are overcome is what we would refer to as the melting point of this pure material. Now let's consider a second example in which we have a crystal which contains an impurity. Shown here is a figure very similar to the one that we just took a look at, but with one important exception. That exception is the presence of one molecule of the impurity within this particular volume of the crystal. And notice that this molecule of impurity doesn't fit as well into the crystal lattice as do the other molecules of our desired compound. We can think of this as a metaphor for the compromised intermolecular forces around that particular site within the crystal because our impurity doesn't fit in as well and isn't sort of custom designed, if you will, to fit into that little niche there, that the intermolecular attractions between it and the surrounding bulk crystal are decreased. And so overall, this means that the crystal is being held together by fewer or weaker intermolecular forces than in the pure version that we just looked at. So let's think about how this decreased overall attractive forces within the crystal will affect its behavior as we heat it. First, let's apply a little bit of heat. Again, we've got a situation where within this molecule, there are vibrations and there's thermal energy there, but it's not adequate to get over the attractive forces that are holding it in the solid phase. And let's increase the heat one more step as we did previously. Now notice that in this case, it took less heat for us to reach a point where the thermal energy is adequate to overcome all the intermolecular forces holding that crystal together in the solid phase. This is a direct result of the presence of the impurity and the reduced attractive forces between the impurity and the rest of the crystal. So for this reason, in most cases, when an impurity is introduced into an organic crystalline solid, the melting point of that material will be reduced. And we refer to this phenomenon typically as melting point depression. So now I'd like to take a moment to think about how what we've just observed, or what the argument that we've just made, allows us to predict the behavior of a typical mixture, or a binary mixture at least, of organic crystalline solids. So let's take a look at a typical 
binary phase diagram for a solid. Shown in this slide is an example of a typical binary phase diagram. That is one which you might see in your textbook uh, or in your laboratory manual. So let's take a look at uh, how exactly this phase diagram is built based upon what we know now about how impurities affect phase behavior of crystals. So we're going to erase this diagram and we're going to fill it back in piece by piece thinking carefully about why each feature is there. All right, let's begin by considering our blank phase diagram here, looking at the left-hand vertical axis. This would be the situation where we have 100 mole percent of our compound of interest, which is the green squares. So if we look at the temperature axis, we expect to see a phase transition occur at certain temperature at which our pure compound converts from solid into liquid. This would be the melting point of our pure compound. Anything below this temperature, solid. Anything above this temperature should be liquid. There's a single transition temperature associated with the melting. Now, as we move from left to right across our axis, what we'll see is that as we add a little bit of this red compound, our impurity, that the melting point is depressed. Remember, our previous discussion predicted that the melting point would go down. But we see another feature to the diagram as well. And that is that as we move from left to right, not only does the melting point decrease, but it also broadens. There's actually a range of temperatures over which a liquid and solid can coexist. So our melting point is no longer really a melting point. It's more like a melting range. As we decrease the melting point temperature, we notice that at first the range of temperatures over which liquid and solid coexist increases and then eventually decreases again until it reaches a point of unity somewhere in the middle of our diagram, though not necessarily at the center. During this phase or during this transition of composition during which there is a liquid and solid coexisting over a range of temperatures, we can think of this as the red compound acting as an impurity in our green square compounds. The point of unity that they reach is known as the eutectic point. And the composition and temperature at this point are also known as eutectic composition and the eutectic temperature. If we continue to alter the composition of our material by adding more and more of the red triangular compound, we begin to reach a point past the eutectic where it's more as though we have the green squares acting as the impurity in a crystal of the red material. And because of this, as we move further and further toward 100 mole percent of the red material, we notice that the melting points begin to increase again and also broaden, reaching a point of unity again at the melting point of that particular compound. So again, we have a region here where we have one compound acting as an impurity in the other, and ultimately we finish at the melting point of that compound, that is the red triangles. Okay, so this is exactly how one of these binary phase diagrams operates. And we're going to use this in our class and in our laboratories as a means of identifying compounds. Because if we're grinding or mixing different compounds into one another, we expect to see certain changes in their phase behavior. Whereas if we're adding a known compound to another sample of itself, we expect to see very different changes. And we'll go over these details in another lecture.